So when someone tries to explain Fermat's principle of least time to you, what they'll usually do is give you an analogy. They'll tell you, okay, so here, here's the ocean, and you're somewhere, you're maybe at point A, and point A is on the white sand, on the beach. And there's somewhere you want to get to, they'll say, in the ocean, which can be at point B. And you want to get from point A to point B in the least time possible. And they'll tell you, okay, of course, there's different paths you could take. You could take the straight line path from A to B. Uh, that wasn't really on the point A, but you see what I mean. Or perhaps because you can run faster on the sand than you can run on, in the water. Perhaps you're going to spend as much time as you can on the sand, like this. And then you're going to turn really sharply and go to B. And you're going to spend very little time in the water, okay? And in reality, as you can probably imagine, it's not going to be either of these extremes, I guess. It's just going to be, the pot's going to be somewhere in this region, yeah? And people will compare this to Fermat's principle of least time, which says that when light takes a path from A to B, it's going to do so in, in the path that takes the shortest time for it to go between those two points. And I think this explanation is a bit unsatisfactory to explain it, because if we imagine that we're at A, we're the light ray, and we're deciding how we're going to get to B, the first thing is that light can't think. We're, we've got this kind of anthropomorphic idea, and it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense at all. That would be the first big problem I have with this explanation. Light, uh, light can't think. Hopefully you can read that. So that's our first problem. And our second problem is that when light is coming in, and light is coming in on, on some, traje some trajectory, I don't know, at the point A, light is not going to change which way it's going. Light isn't going to decide which path it's going at point A. Because if light is on the sand, and it's heading along, along a path like this arrow, it's not going to suddenly change. It's not going to change in until it changes medium, until it, I guess, gets to the ocean and it refracts or something like that. And in that sense, we're not like trying to decide a path from point A to point B. What we're really doing is trying to decide where point B is in the first place. There's no guarantee that light was ever going to go to point B. And so, and so when we say, okay, well, where's point B going to be, right? Well, we start to talk about Snell's law. And Snell's law is saying that um, it's, it's telling us a relationship between the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction so we can find out what path we're going to come out once we get into the ocean. And people are going to prove Snell's law using Fermat's principle of least time. And that seems really contradictory because we just said that like none of this, none of this is making sense. Our second problem is that we don't know where the point B is. Hopefully I can start to give a more satisfactory explanation as to how light somehow can decide which way to go and also as to how point B actually gets determined. Okay, so let's start talking about the, the first problem when light is trying to get from point A to point B and we're asking how does it decide what path to take? How does it how does it know which one's going to be the shortest? Can it see into the future or something? Okay, well, let's talk about this. So as you can probably imagine, if point A and B are in the same medium as, as they are here where I've drawn them, you can imagine that from your intuition, light would just go in a straight line, right? And you're right, you're correct. But how does it even decide to go in a straight line? Well, this is the simplest case and we can, we can have a look. So let's imagine light travels for a little bit along here. And so there's this idea that every single point, every single point along this wave, because light is a wave, it's just a, it's just a disturbance in the air, really, or in, it could even be in a vacuum. It's just energy moving along, right? And so the, every single point along this wave is going to be like a new point source, a new point source for more light. That is that it's, it's, it's luminous. It's giving off more light. It's giving off more waves. So you can imagine that here, let me get yellow, we have a wave 
which is protruding from this point. The normal wave continues as well, right? And this is happening at every single point. I could pick any point along here. It could be this point here. And I could draw another another wave protruding from here, okay? And also, this is happening on these little waves, right? These little waves here and these little waves here. Every single one is moving out. So light is basically just emerging in every single direction, right? And this, this seems very counterintuitive because we know about conservation of energy. We, we, we know from experience that when you see light, it doesn't all just explode outwards. So what exactly is going on here? Why is, why is all this new light being made? Where is it all going? Okay, so first let's try and explain that. Right? We have this idea, and let me draw a graph here. Hopefully you won't mind. We have this idea of interference. So if we have two waves, and normally we draw waves like this. Um, I'll draw in yellow again. Right? Normally we draw waves something like this. They're sinusoidal functions. And on the top we have their, on the y-axis we have their amplitude. Okay, I'll just put an A for amplitude. And along here, we have the position along the wave. Okay, so I'll just put X. Right? And so if we have two waves, which are stacked on top of each other, so we have the yellow wave, and now we also have the red wave. Right? The yellow wave and the red wave are in sync. And we kind of, we kind of add waves together. So what happens here is that the whole wave is going to get amplified. It's going to go up. The, the, the sum of the waves, actually, I'll put the sum of the waves in orange. Right? So it's the same as the other waves, but bigger. It's just a bigger wave. That's all it really is. Okay, so let me go back a little bit. And let's imagine that instead our red wave was not like this. Instead, our red wave was kind of opposite. Right? These aren't great drawings, but hopefully you can see what I mean. It was kind of opposite to the yellow wave. Where the, where the peaks of the yellow wave are, we see the valleys of the red wave. So here, we're going to get uh, another type of interference. What we saw before when we created the orange wave was constructive interference because we, we constructed the wave, we made it bigger. Here, the waves are going to kind of cancel out when they're opposite. Right? They're going to cancel out. And you can imagine, okay, let's see. Um, if I did a new wave, it's probably going to be pretty much a straight line along here, right? So that's destructive interference when, when the waves kind of cancel out. So what we're seeing when we have all of these different waves protruding out from here, and, and effectively you'd get all these different paths from A to B, right? You can imagine all these different parts, okay? So the real question is, which of the parts are actually gonna stay there? Because in most cases, in most cases, all these different parts, like if, see, we have this orange path here at the top, and now if I draw a red path in as well, if we, if we investigate just this point here, but this is really happening everywhere along the way. If we investigate just this point, so the orange path and the red path both arrived here, but I guess they kind of arrived here at different times at this point, right? And this is going to be happening at every single point, pretty much, almost every single point along here. All these different, all these different paths are going to arrive here at different times. And because they're arriving at different times, their phases, if we look back at our diagram down here, their phases, so where the wave is at a different point, how far along it's been translated, I guess, along the X, are going to be all out of sync. So because they're out of sync, they're all going to be destructively interfere. So all of these different points everywhere, like every single point I could pick, the points right near the beginning, like these waves never really even happen because there's so much destructive interference, right? So conservation of energy isn't really violated because all, all these waves never really come about. They all, they all interfere. And all the ones going backwards as well, you can imagine, they're all going to destructively interfere and they're going to kind of be cancelled out by the other waves that are there. Right? So our real question is, where does the most constructive interference happen? Because that's going to be the path that it's going to take, the, the place where there isn't really very much interference. So let's come along here. Right? This is the straight line path. Okay, so 
let's quickly let's quickly draw a part. Let's draw a graph of um, the time. Sorry. We're going to have time on the y-axis, the time taken. And on the x-axis, I'm going to put the path, right? And the path might be multiple dimensions. It might be, we're just kind of simplifying it here. You can imagine as we come across from left to right, we have a bunch of different paths. That's all that's really important, okay? So if we draw this graph, you might imagine that most of the paths are going to take a really long time. Right. And there's going to be some path here at the bottom, which is going to take the least time. We're going to have some minimum time path. And you can see the yellow path that I've drawn between A and B. You can imagine because that's the shortest distance. There's no change in mediums or anything that the path that takes the shortest time is going to be that path. Right. What we also know, if we know a little bit of calculus, you don't even really need calculus to see this. But down here, down here, the gradient at this point the instantaneous rate of change of the graph at the minimum we know is going to be zero. The rate of change is zero at the bottom. Okay, so what that means is that if we go a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, if, if, if we change to a couple of different paths that are pretty much all the same, right, and I'm going to draw a couple of different paths that are all the same, there's some kind of tolerance factor of how much we can tolerate of changes, right? Because the gradient down here at the bottom of this graph is zero, because there's no rate of change in how much time it's going to take, what we see is that all of these different paths that are pretty much a straight line are going to take about, they're, they're going to take pretty much the same time, right? So all of these different waves that go straight along here from A to B, all of them are going to arrive almost exactly in, fa in phase, right? So they're all going to constructively interfere with one another and all the strength of the signal is going to go here. So we call this a critical point here at, at the minimum of the graph, or maybe we call it um, a stationary point because nothing's changing. So it makes sense everywhere else, everywhere if I pick a point along the graph and I go a little bit to the left along the graph or a little bit to the right, if I change the path just slightly, you're going to see, you're going to see big changes in time. So let's see, look, I change the path a little bit slightly here and, and I go up by heaps, or I change the path a little bit slightly here, and I go down by heaps, because we have this big steep slope. But the points that we're considering, the real important points, are these points right at the bottom of the graph, the stationary points, because that's where we're going to get all the constructive interference, and that's where our final signal is going to be. It's going to be along the straightest line. And what we're saying, what we know from calculus, what we know is that the points where the gradient are zero, the points where the gradient is zero are minima and maxima of the function. So for all our different paths, the paths with the least or most time, and usually, usually it's called Fermat's principle of least time because usually we're considering only really the least time, but sometimes, sometimes it can be different. Um, those points are going to be the ones which the light is going to take because that's where the most constructive interference is going to be. That's where all the light is going to come to the end in phase. Okay, so now I've ticked off our first problem, the light thinks problem, because hopefully that's become a bit clearer that light isn't thinking, and it's just, it's just going on the path that has the most constructive interference. And hopefully now we can use what we learned to understand the second problem, which is how is point B actually determined? Because most people are going to tell you we're trying to get from point A to point B, right? And the secret is that point B isn't fixed. So the confusing part is, is when we have our light ray and it's going across here and they tell you, okay, well, it's going to take the shortest possible path from point A to point B. But in a lot of cases, in a lot of cases, when it switches medium and it bends, I've got the gray as the, as the barrier between the mediums. In some cases, yeah, maybe it's going to pass through B. But in a lot of cases, it's going to bend completely differently than that. It's not going to pass through B. So how do we know where it's actually going to go? And this is where we see that Fermat's principle isn't so fundamental as what we were talking about before, because what decides uh, Fermat's principle is just a consequence of how, of how it's going to choose its path. It's going to take the path with the most constructive in interference. And we saw from the graph before that as it happens, that path also has the least time. 
right? But for, for Mars principle is not how it chooses the path. It chooses the path by, by sending out all these different rays by every point along the way being, um, being another source for more waves. So for Mars principle is just a little consequence of this. And when we use for Mars principle to say prove Snell's law or something like that, or prove the, the, ro- the law of reflection, what we're really saying is that um, for any point, for any point B, which is already on the path, right? For any point B on the path, we can apply Snell's law to that A and that B. It's not just for any point B because most of these points B, the, the rays will never pass through. So hopefully that makes a little more sense, right? Because it seems kind of self-referential when we use Fermat's principle to prove Snell's law, right? But we're just saying that Fermat's principle is this property that any two points along the trajectory of the ray are going to have. Any two tra- points along the trajectory are, are going to have the property that when you go from A to B, because it's the path of the most constructive interference, because of that, um, it's going to also be the path of least time.